The God that we meet week after week in Scripture it tends to be weird. I don't know that you've ever heard a priest say such a thing, but it's absolutely true. Our God is odd. It even rhymes. Because God acts in ways that we would never act. He does things that at least nobody in our neighborhoods would ever do, all the while put, putting himself out there in ways that we would just assume no respectable God ever would. Now, this claim that I'm making that God is different, or as I just put it, weird, is in fact one of the major themes of the Bible. They say it a little different. They say it like this, quoting God, my ways are not your ways, which is a huge understatement. And certainly the scriptures that we have before us today insist on this truth. Of course, in this day and age in which we live, we're told by many people that all of this stuff of faith is actually nothing more than our own wish projection. That's what we're told by the new atheist movement, for instance, if you've ever come across them, who parenthetically sound precisely like the old atheist movement, just with the shrill cranked up to 11. But what they insist is that people like us doing the things that we're doing today and having done it over millennia, that what we've done is that we've dreamed up this God in the sky and we've done this to cushion ourselves from the harsh realities of life that we just don't want to have to face. Making God into nothing more than our wishes turned into theology. And yet I would suggest that if we were going to dream up a God, that the God of our imaginations would look far different than the one that we meet in the Bible. Certainly far different than the God who encounters Moses this morning, far different than the one who confronts Peter today. Because that God in this world is weird. Let me try to show you what I mean. Today we meet up with Moses doing a very normal, non-weird human activity. He's running away from life. Now this we know. Such an activity around here is sad, but unfortunately it's not odd. Moses is out there running away from his past, from his identity, from the people who raised him, the people of Egypt, and the people to whom he just found out that he belongs to, the Hebrew slaves. So Moses, we get, I mean, if I look at him closely, it almost seems to remind me of me at like age 21 or something. Kind of embarrassed at that time, you know, it was uh, the age. You know, there was grunge music everywhere and everybody wore drab clothes and felt sorry for ourselves with weird haircuts. You know, everything was life has dealt me the worst cards ever and we moped around college. Oddly enough, living really pretty good lives driving nice cars, listening to like Nirvana, telling us that our lives are no good. Perhaps you know the type of young person this can be, perhaps. If you were from Generation, generation X like me, you were the type. And, and that's basically Moses when we meet up with him today. He's out there moping around in his faded jeans and T-shirt, listening to Radiohead or whatever the kids were listening to in those days. And he's just hoping all the while that no one will ever find him out out there, where he's running away from life. Out there, away from the house of Pharaoh in which he was raised. Out there, away from his Hebrew ancestry he just discovered he had on Ancestry.com. Out there, where no one could find him or touch him as he brooded and sulked and fled a life he just couldn't stand anymore. Out there. The only problem is Moses left one humongous thing out of his equation. It turns out that God was out there too. 
which seem quite unlikely to Moses, weird in fact, because, see, Moses was on Mount Horeb, which means probably nothing to you until I tell you that this is a mountain which is named, literally means wasteland. Moses has retreated to the wasteland. He's in Nowheresville, Sinai Peninsula. It's the perfect place to not be found. There's nothing pretty or good or, or anything about that that would attract a God of power and might, and yet still there's God, which surprises Moses and makes him wonder, now what sort of weird God is this who hangs out in the wastelands? Ours. Ours does. Because he's weird. See, I told you. But Moses just can't believe this, and he's shocked that, that God's out there, and shocked all the more by what God tells him out there. Moses, go and tell the mighty, mighty Egyptians, the most mighty empire around, that you met this God while hanging out in the boonies. And that this God demands that, that these Egyptians, they give up all of their economic well-being and their sense of themselves as superior to all other people, and they let their slaves go. Let my people go. And if they argue with you or say, well, they don't really feel like doing that, just again tell them that you know this boonie dwelling God and that he demands it. Well, Moses, you know, thinks there might just be a couple of holes in, in this plan. And so Moses feels compelled to tell God how things work around here. The mighty always get their way, God. To which God feels compelled to tell Moses how God works around everywhere. God gets God's way everywhere, Moses. Well, Moses still thinks this is all very odd, still isn't very sure about all this, and so he says, now just who are you? To which God answers, I am who I am. I am exactly who I am. That is, I will be who I decide to be, as weird as you may find it, as inconvenient as it may be for the Egyptians, I alone will decide who I am as God. Your ideas are not going to box me in. Your agendas are not going to overtake my own. Your priorities and timetables and ways of normally acting around here, they're not going to move me one bit because I'm no mere wish projection. Sorry, new atheists and old. Instead, I'm the God who you would have never dreamed of dreaming up. You see, he's marvelously different. He's wonderfully weird in this world that's just dying for different and weird, if you ask me. And thus, be it in the wastelands are in the very courts of power, this God will be who this God decides to be. And this is the exact same peculiar God we meet in Jesus, that we encounter today in Jesus' confrontation with Peter. You may recognize today's gospel lesson as a continuation of the story we began, began last Sunday, if you were here, when Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And to that, well, people had all kinds of answers as to who they said Jesus was. Uh, people said that Jesus was supposed to be all kinds of things, and by the way, they still do. Everybody just loves throwing a lasso around Jesus, trying to get him onto their agendas and their ideologies and their politics and all the rest, and tell Jesus the, exactly the sort of Jesus he has to be. The only problem is, as we learned today, it doesn't matter at all who people say that Jesus is. All that matters at all is who God in Jesus says that Jesus is. Because this isn't about our wish projections. This isn't about business as normal or Jesus would have never shown up around here to upturn normal. Our God's too real and too unique and too interesting for all of that. He'll be who he will be. 
I am who I am, no matter the cost. And thus, Jesus will not turn his back on Jerusalem. He will not walk in the other direction, even though that's what we would probably do. He will not avoid his cruel fate for expediency. Because if he did that, he wouldn't be him. He'd just be normal. He'd just be us. And the truth is, we don't need more normal in this world. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. And that's why he came, so we could have different. So that his wonderfully weird could overtake our death-dealing normal. And that's who Jesus' disciples encountered that day at Caesarea Philippi, and it scared the wits out of them. So much so that they, that they went aside and tried to drag Jesus back to something approaching normal, saying, you know, Jesus, these ideas that you've been teaching, they've been very inspirational. I mean, they've been, they've been great. They're, you know, just wonderful, uplifting, spiritual concepts. Love them. But what you're talking about here is crazy. Actually putting that stuff into action, you know, things like the Beatitudes, you can't put that into action. It's the real world. It'll never work because if you do what you're talking about doing, you stretch out your neck that far, you take that much of a risk, well, you're liable to get yourself crucified or something. Peter goes even further. God forbid, he says. God forbid that you, Jesus, should go that far outside of the bounds of normal. God forbid that you would reach that much further than any other person would ever dare reach. God forbid, in other words, that you should act like this weird God that I just proclaimed you to be when I said that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. God forbid. And although I'm quite sure that Jesus would have loved to have figured out another way to live, the truth is, but it's, it's a sad truth, but it's still the truth, that any time that anyone so relentlessly is honest in this world, so relentlessly is determined to put up a mirror in front of the hard and sinful and customary ways of this world, showing us that our kingdoms are too often built on greed and self-interest and on the backs of the least among us. Well, when somebody does that, we're liable to hang them out to die. But Jesus is willing to be hung out to die in order to unthrone those lies. Because he will be who he alone says he will be, even when we find it weird. God in, in Jesus is about something bigger than we may have at first thought. He's, his way is, is not the typical way of, of shortcuts and compromises and ends justify the means and I'm just going along to get along and all the other things that we do to only go halfway. No, his way will lead all the way even to the cross. It will go to that place that we would rather not look that place where the innocent get slaughtered, where the truth is mocked and killed, where religion is used as a weapon, and the kingdoms of this world are built on the backs of others. But Jesus is still going there, because Jesus is no typical halfway God, even though that makes him in this world weird. And yet for all of us who have come to know the salvation that, that came because of his rejection of our halfway ways, we receive it as gospel, as good news that Jesus did not just go halfway for our salvation. That God did not listen to the timidity of Moses. That God would not deal with the compromises of Peter and the disciples. That God does not ever follow the normal ways of this world. Thank God he's different than that. He's different than us. God forbid. God forbid that God would ever start listening to us about being God. 
I am who I am, says God, which is great news. Maybe especially because in this world, we're just dying for different, even weird. So embrace it. Amen.